All right, so uh, Rick Carlisle is going to moderate this. Uh, Rico, as we love to call him, is the uh, uh, Bartley Dobb Professor for Study and Prevention of Violence in the School of Social Work at, at the University of Washington. And I'll let you take it from, from here, Rico. Great. Everybody struggled with this. It's okay, I'll just stand on tiptoe. Um, so our panel is about the need uh, for local capacity, resources, and political will to take advantage of the evidence base for prevention science that you've just heard a lot about. And without uh, those three elements, uh, we really uh, can't get evidence-based practices on the ground in communities to help uh, change uh, the developmental experiences of kids in our communities. Um, I have a series of questions that I'm going to uh, pose to our panelists who are experts in behavioral health and public health uh, to really describe uh, both essential elements of the particular question as well as what are the barriers and facilitators uh, uh, to that uh, process itself. Um, and uh, I'm just going to ask, uh, since we only have a short time today, uh, and I haven't talked to all the presenters, I did get a chance to talk to Jessica before uh, her dinner last night. <laughs> And I say, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to ask a que pose a question, and I'd like less than a two-minute response from someone. And I know how hard that could be. Uh, <laughs> but, and everyone doesn't have to have a two-minute response to each question. Otherwise, we will never eat lunch today. Uh, so what I'd like to do is then say, do you, does anyone have anything else to add? Um, and so we'll try uh, and see. Uh, what my skills are as a facilitator. Um, and I'd like each panelist just to spend a minute on giving uh, a little bit about their background. And uh, is Amanda now at the end? Sure, Why yeah. don't you start and sure. just, just a minute, just tell people where you are and where your expertise lies. Sure, sure. So I am the Director of Implementation at Invest in Kids, and we are a state-based intermediary here in Colorado. So our whole mission is to support evidence-based prevention programs in Colorado in that zero to six space. So we support uh, three of the Incredible Years programs, and we also offer support for the Nurse Family Partnership in Colorado. So Nurse Family Partnership in all 64 counties in Colorado, um, we support all of those nurse supervisors through our staff. Um, and then with the Incredible Years programs, we're in 23 counties right now in Colorado, about 51 sites, and we provide comprehensive implementation support, implementation planning, taking sites through all the stages of implementation. So um, as you can see, implementation is my key word. I will echo some of Sue Kern's comments, I'm sure, around implementation science and the importance of that um, through all of this. And it's, a, it's important for the people here from the communities that care, communities too, to start figuring out who all the people are in the last panel and in this panel and start th thinking through how to connect to them. Brian? Well, apparently I'm uh, now with the Colorado Department of Education. <laughs> no, that's, that's not true. Um, uh, so Brian Bumbarger, as, as David Hawkins mentioned this morning, um, uh, my background, uh, I was in, uh, at the Prevention Research Center at Penn State University, uh, and for about 20 years in Pennsylvania, I worked in partnership with several state agencies to scale up uh, both communities that care and uh, a menu of blueprints programs across the state. So we had, uh, we worked in over 100 uh, communities implementing the Communities That Care model, which led those communities to select and implement uh, uh, over 300 replications of, of different blueprint programs. So my work is really, um, I guess, in, in two areas. Uh, one is around this uh, community level capacity building through community coalitions applying good prevention science to, in, to uh, improve decision making around selecting and implementing uh, effective prevention programs. And then the other, the other area I work a lot in is uh, around capacity building within public systems. And that's kind of what we'll talk about in this panel today around uh, state, building state infrastructure to unleash the power of prevention. Jessica? 
Hi, my name is Jessica Corvinus, and I'm with the Governor's Office of State Planning and Budgeting. I am the newly minted Research and Evidence-Based Policy Initiatives Manager. Um, that title really comes from the fact that we know that evidence-based policy is a bigger initiative. It revolves around effective evidence-based programs, building our evidence, implementation, evaluation. Kind of prior to that, I was working on results first. Um, David mentioned the Washington State Institute for Public Policy. That's an econometric tool that allows us to do benefit cost analyses. We actually have done that in the state of Colorado, looking at several of our state programs, running those analyses and saying, what do we know about what we're doing here in the state? What's the evidence level? What's their effectiveness? What's their return on investment? But again, and kind of bringing, bringing the broader scope together, really thinking about evidence-based policy making as a whole, which is why that is now part of my title. Um, and actually, prior to joining the governor's office, I worked at um, Blueprints. So I was at the Center for the Study and Prevention of Violence. I was a life skills training field representative. They are actually called implementation specialists now, from what I understand, So, um, which is really exciting. So really thinking about, are we implementing our evidence-based strategies with fidelity, and how do we um, make sure that we're delivering the best services? Great. Thank you. Susan? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Susan Kasky. I'm from Boulder County. I'm the director for the IMPACT, which stands for Integrated Managed Partnership for Adolescent and Child Community Treatment. I've been doing it for 13 years, and I still can't get it out. <laughs> um, uh, the director for the Impact Care Management Division with Housing and Human Services, and I'm also the executive director for the Impact Partnership. We're a collaboration of 12 different agencies, and we act as the system of care for high acuity youth in Boulder County. Great. Just a wealth of experience here today, and uh, I just, it's so great to be in Colorado uh, and actually unleashing the power of Pennsylvania <laughs> <laughs> in Colorado because uh, now Brian is, uh, has come here to mostly ski, I understand, but uh, also to help. Uh, also fly fish and ride horses. <laughs> yes, okay. So uh, he's been unleashed on Colorado. But uh, I, my first question is, um, and, you know, we'll, let, uh, we'll play for 20 points. Whoever pushes their buzzer first uh, will answer the question. What are the key elements of prevention infrastructure? I can chime in first and be brief right ahead. in my response. Um, and it really has to do with us as an intermediary organization. So I see this um, role as an intermediary as really being a key element of the prevention infrastructure. So um, once you sort of get started with implementation, who's there to keep you on track? Who's there to even sort of um, I don't know, talk through what all the important elements of implementation are. So sort of having that backbone organization, um, I think as it may have been called earlier as well. So as I said, we're really focusing on offering that implementation support for the incredible years and the nurse family partnership. Um, and some of the key elements sort of of that infrastructure and implementation support for us are around building that local capacity uh, for implementation, so in the way of building local implementation teams. So um, as we build our expertise as the intermediary organization, we also want to hand that capacity off to the local organization. So local implementation teams or community advisory boards if we're working with the Nurse Family Partnership. Um, and another key piece of that prevention infrastructure for us is really ensuring community readiness for either of those programs through an in-depth uh, process. So really looking at a whole exploration and readiness process to say, um, are these programs a fit for your community? Um, is the Investing Kids implementation support a fit for your community as well? So those are some of our key elements. So implementation support, community team building, and also fit are three elements of yes. important uh, prevention infrastructures. Anybody have things to add? I would just add an alignment around community indicators and the CTC model, the community set care model that you're all going to hear about later, I think is a really good model to help do that with, with communities. Um, I also think there's something about communities' ability to be agile and be able to integrate. We talk a lot about collaboration. But I think in order to really support prevention efforts, you need to be able to, to have deep integration across communities mm -hmm. and have a community that has agreement around three or five primary indicators that you want to target. And I think probably all of us have experienced 
living in communities that you see a lot of needs and you want to address all of those needs. But I think that if the ability of the community to come together to address those top needs is going to be the most effective. Um, and just to, to echo what Amanda was saying, I think having that backbone organization, which the CTC um, creates, is a really important thing to have a coordinating body around the prevention and efforts is very important. So good monitoring, selection of a key, a set of key uh, indicators uh, for uh, movement. And does anybody have anything else? I was just going to say coordination, not just collaboration, but actual coordination and thinking about leveraging what already exists so that you're not kind of recreating everything, but you might have some aspects that are going to help you build up more, but you're not creating more work. Yeah. And lack of duplication, perhaps, as well. Coordination, remove the duplication and enhance, you know, uh, filling the gaps mm -hmm. there. And, and capacity building among public systems, I think it is 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 key. I mean, the, the keep in mind that the the public systems that serve and fund and set the policy and regulatory parameters around all the work that ends up happening at the individual uh, and community level, those public systems long predate any of this evidence. So they've been around for a long time and they've, they've evolved or devolved to work a certain way. That, that is bureaucracy and they're rewarded for efficiency, right? And so they've figured out the most efficient way to work. Now we've thrown into that pond this rock of evidence and, and, and introduced this entire research base that David Hawkins uh, spoke about this morning. So we, we really need to, uh, to facilitate public systems taking a step back and say, how do we now retrofit what we do as public systems in, in our individual system silos and the things that are important to each of those system silos? How do we, how do we retrofit to become more uh, enabling context to, to better use prevention science. Great, so getting the systems to change too to help move from their current model to a model that takes into account evidence and helps support communities to do that. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I'm going to move on. I was going to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how do we get communities to value, fund, and build and sustain them, but I think You've had some really good uh, ideas here. But I think the next thing that I'd like you all to talk about are what are critical elements to achieve sufficient intervention reach or scope uh, to have population level effects? Anyone can press the red buzzer. Well, one, one of the things that I think um, is extremely beneficial in the communities that care process is that <clears throat> in a, in a, a, after the, uh, as you'll read on your communities that care description in your folders, after the community com brings together this multi-stakeholder coalition and they collect data on risk and protective factors to sort of create a diagnostic profile of that individual community's needs, the next step then is to select a small number of priorities and then based on that small number of priorities, figure out what's already going on in the community. And figuring out what's already going on in the community means sort of creating a matrix across the different ecological levels, across the different levels of prevention from universal prevention to treatment, and laying all that out there. It's like, uh, it's like dumping out the, the, the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle at the beginning and then organizing them, you know, you flip all the pieces over so the picture is on, and on top, and then you sort of get a lay of the land. You, you understand what, what, what tools you have available. So I think one of the things that's really helpful in this process to getting to population level outcomes is laying out all of those pieces, finding out how they all connect together, and thinking about what's missing, and then, and then filling the gaps of what's missing with the things that have the strongest evidence of effectiveness. Okay, so putting the jigsaw puzzle together in a, in a way that you can actually see it in front of you as a map of where, what things, what good evidence-based programs are going on, where they might need to be expanded, and where the gaps are. Right, it's no, there's no one program that's going to make the community better. No, we right? know it's, no it's how all of the, yes. It's all of the different programs and services, how they fit together and where there are gaps in the, in the developmental stages across the prevention to treatment continuum, et cetera. 
Good. Does anybody have things to add to that? Reach. It's intervention reach. Sure, I have a few things. Yeah, I'm to sure add. you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we would love to be all across Colorado with the incredible years uh, specifically. Um, so for us, our first question is really to ask, who are we trying to reach? So looking into communities to see, do we have the right population for the Incredible Years programs, uh, specifically pre-K, kindergarten, classroom, social emotional development is what we're looking for. So number one is knowing who our target population is. Uh, number two, and hopefully I'm preaching to the choir, is that we're ensuring and supporting program fidelity. Uh, we could have the program in all 64 counties in the state, um, and if there is low fidelity implementation and low fidelity use of the program, then we aren't really reaching anyone, are we? Or maybe we're doing harm, we don't know. So ensuring and supporting program <coughs> fidelity. And then lastly um, is retention. So we as an organization are working to train and coach new implementers every year. So we would like to be building up those implementers over time. If we have a lot of turnover, um, which of course happens, especially in education, uh, pre-K teachers not paid very well, um, then we're not really increasing our reach. That's a big barrier for us and something that we really have to overcome is that retention piece if we're actually going to get to reach in the state. Good, I want you to hold on to that thought because we'll be talking a little bit about workforce as well. Does any <laughs> Anyone else have something to add? Well, just from a kind of a larger state perspective, again, to kind of echo what Amanda is saying when we're asking, you know, what are we trying to do? What are we trying to accomplish? How are we trying to get there? We're actually asking state agencies through the budget process as they're requesting money from our office to say, what are you trying to do? What are the outcomes you're trying to impact? And how are you going to get there? And are you building in dollars for implementation and evaluation? So we're starting to think about this from the state perspective as well, and hopefully we can help kind of break down some of those barriers just to get people thinking about it on the front end. Anyone else? Great, thank you guys. Um, so now uh, we're going to move to workforce. And so what are the critical elements required of the workforce to sustain evidence-based preventive interventions? We've talked a little bit about the prevention infrastructure We've talked a little bit more about how you get reach. You know, it's not gonna be good if we have an evidence-based program in every county, but it's only reaching 10 people. So we've gotta get to everybody with fidelity because we heard earlier I, from someone about multi-systemic therapy not being implemented well can actually have iatrogenic effects as well. So we need to make sure it's well done. That's part of reach, getting people trained up. But what about the workforce now? And I think. Amanda, maybe you already started leading into that, but. Uh. Sure, and I have a few um, quick points that I could just mention around workforce and talking with our nurse family partnership director and our incredible years director, some thoughts they had as well to kind of bring our whole perspective in. Um, so I think understanding research as a practitioner, um, understanding data as a practitioner as in the workforce is really important and really knowing what kind of practice implications that research is really going to have. Um, having that sort of continuous quality improvement mindset and understanding that it's the data that drives practice and not just um, what you've been doing for the last 20 years um, that can drive that practice as well. And then um, one key piece that we all agreed on at Invest in Kids was really that continued education, opportunities to talk with other professionals who are doing the same program, having a community of practice, again, so you can sort of have that uh, continuous quality improvement mindset. Okay, so good skills, making sure you build capacity of your implementers and making sure that there is a community of practice as well. What about else for workforce development? Susan, do you have something yeah, to add? I, I feel like it's important for everyone who's in the workforce to know where they're fitting in the larger integration system, mm -hmm. that they're not working in a silo, that they understand the full uh, services continuum, and again, where they fit in in that continuum. I feel like it's a really important piece. And I, again, would just agree with everything that Amanda was saying. We had experience in um, trying to implement high fidelity wrap wraparound in 2004. It was not successful. So we did what a lot of people do is we blamed the intervention. We said, <laughs> this is a bad intervention. And realized once we had, um, had were educated around impl implementation science that 
Um, we did not do a good, good job of implementing it and engaging the implementers um, in a good way. And we've recently, the last two years, uh, re-implemented and it's been very successful in really paying a lot of attention to implementation drivers. Um, and the, the implementers of that service feel very supported, very engaged, our turnover is very low in that. So I think using implementation frameworks is an important piece because it is so focused on, on the implementer of the service. And I'm saying implementer, yeah. happy with that a lot, <laughs> implementation a lot. So. Great, yeah. anyone else have something to add? I noticed that uh, no one talked about the uh, fiscal system that supports our folks, and I thought maybe Amanda was going to go there <laughs> because she said, you know, the real problem is is that we can, we know how to train. I'm not putting words in your mouth. Sorry. I'll tell you what I think the real problem is. <laughs> uh, is that we can do a good job. We can train up our implementers. If we listen and hear where they're at, we can build their capacity. We can work with program developers to make sure they're doing things in the right way and then they get the next job. So how do, we, how do we do two things, or how do we think about two things? One is providing a really professional development track so that there's, you know, that prevention implementers don't just go on to the next best paying job in a totally different field so that we lose them. There's actually vertical ways for them to go vertically and not just to the governor's office, but that could be where they're <laughs> too. But that they're really valued, you know, so that's one piece. And uh, another one is perhaps how do we do good pre-service education? So mm -hmm. I think any responses to any of either of those things? How do we really, how do we get prevention workforce to be valued so it sticks around long enough? Definitely. Well, I know, I know. <laughs> I have I have my hand here. I have my hand. What? Yeah. Well, well, it, you know, I, as a continuation of this theme of capacity building within public systems, the local prevention delivery network in any community. So you think about the all of the the NGOs, the service providers uh, uh, that exist in any community that end up providing the ultimate services. That network in any community is a reflection of exactly what the systems drive and fund and the parameters that the public systems have established. So, you know, again, part of, part of this, part of my vision of public systems stepping back and thinking, how do we shake up things? How do we reinvent the way public systems work to create enabling contexts for prevention science? Uh, for high quality prevention and preventive interventions to be delivered locally is to really think about how they can shake up that local provider network and the way that that has evolved into a into a, an inefficient usually competitive system um, it's poorly funded um, it's it's this you know it's this patchwork quilt of mom and pop you know church group basement organizations holding car washes and bake sales to keep their people employed. But now that we have an emerging science that clearly establishes that we can prevent, we can effectively significantly prevent all of those many problems that were on David's first slide, we know that for a fact now. We have an ethical and fiscal imperative to create a local service provision infrastructure that that effectively unleashes that potential. And I, I, I would just say, I know uh, David talked a little bit about this, but you know, if we can kind of put that fiscal impact and we can say, hey, this is some, what we could anticipate that we avoid in terms of you know, future spending, if there's a way to reinvest some of that future savings into prevention, prevention work, you know, the workforce, the development, I think the, the kind of go-to is just, oh, well, we're going to fund this effective evidence-based thing, and then we're done. We did the one-time funding. Yeah. We did it. But you need to continue to, to have the implementation supports, and that's not just technical assistance. That's not just one training. You go to a CTC training, and now you know how to do it. It's the ongoing coaching support and feedback, so building in that funding to continually support those things, I think if we start thinking about budgeting for these things and planning for these things in a way that's not just a one-off, one-time strategy, we'll kind of build that infrastructure. Right. Thank you. Any 
anything, anyone have anything else to add? I, I think would just add about the de-siloing de of systems and yeah. another local example. So we've been working for many years, our collaboration has been in, in existence since 1997 to reduce uh, the number of kids who are on probation and we've been very successful at that. We have one of the lowest number of kids in commitment uh, as well. And we never see any of those probation dollars. We have other flexible funding that we are able to reinvest into early intervention and prevention, and that's part of our long-term vision. But the judicial dollars, we never see that, regardless of how much we reduce um, those numbers. So it's just, it's just one example of siloed systems that um, no matter what the, how good the work is at the local level, um, we're, we're not able to take those dollars and, and reinvest. Right, and I think that's also, it really, it takes someone, you can see from the cost benefit work, research that's done, it's often it takes an investment in one system or in one place in order to re recoup benefits, you know, over the life course in multiple systems later on, mm -hmm. so it takes someone uh, like a governor in a state or someone who is um, n not only putting pressure on governors but someone who can see the whole picture and it might be in communities it's the mayor or the, you know the one or the county executive however it happens to be that can say it's worth making this investment here because in the long run our community our county our state will actually reap the rewards but you can't do it as a one-off basis I agree with you we need to get David's graph of uh, prevention investment at the federal level to at least come half, if not all the way, equal to the treatment and uh, law enforcement and, and uh, eradication efforts. So, okay, my soapbox is off. Um, how about, well, this is the thing. How about the last question that we have? Uh, Jeff, I don't know how good I'm doing on your time. I got about five to eight minutes or so, yeah. Uh, so the last question is, what are the strategies for increasing resources uh, to be able to build the sustainable prevention infrastructure? Anybody have a guess at, or? Uh? I think we've, we've mentioned a, a few things, but one of the things I would add is community, community's willingness to end ineffective programs. It's really hard to um, end a program when you have people attached to that, to that program. And we see it all the time. We, we have programs like that in Boulder that we know, we see the data, it's not as effective as we'd want for it to be. So I think that's a, that's a way to recoup some funding to reinvest in other places or to have some technical assistance to be able to improve that program, um, I think is, is very helpful also. Well, Rico, you know that you and I and David and Kevin and, and a bunch of other um, uh, really great, smart people are working together with the, the Annie E. Casey Foundation on a project called Evidence to Success, which, um, which expands on the, the evidence base of communities that care. And one of the interesting things about the, this Evidence to Success model is the addition of, of fund mapping, uh, of, of including gathering and, and, and uh, giving back um, financial data, expenditure data. So in the, same, in the same way that in communities that care, we try to increase the rigor of decision making about the selection, the choice and selection and implementation of, of programs and strategies by using uh, risk and protective factor data. Once communities have that data, it's, it, 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 uh, it's, it's extremely helpful in driving their better decision making. Uh, likewise, in, in evidence of success, we gather data on spending. We, we gather data on you know, what, where's the money coming from and where's it going out to. And that seems like it should be a no-brainer, but um, in, in almost every community or state that I've worked in, and I, I, this doesn't apply to Colorado because I don't know yet, but in every other community or state that I've worked in, um, uh, I can, it, I continue to see that policymakers really don't have, uh, whether at the state level or at the, at the county or local city level, policymakers don't really have a good handle on where all the money's going and, and what percentage of that money is going towards things that actually have evidence of effectiveness. So if we can gather that data on what, what we're currently spending money on 
and, and we can articulate what percentage of that expenditure is actually going towards things that have evidence of effectiveness, whether randomized trial evidence of effectiveness or even local evaluation evidence of effectiveness, um, that really facilitates better decision making about expenditures. A lot of the, you know, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the bad decisions are that, that we see being made about expenditures of public resources are in the absence of good data. Anyone else have well, something to add? I'll just piggyback on what Brian said, and you're right. I mean, we, we try to do that here at the state level, think about what are we spending our dollars on, how are we spending them, what are, what's going towards effective programming, all of that, but, you know, program budgets and how they're reported aren't always reported in a very easy way for us to say, well, these go to evidence-based programs and these don't. It's just programs aren't budgeted that way, so it's kind of a, a tricky a tricky situation, but it's in something we're trying to dig into. But I think the, the one thing I wanted to highlight from what Brian said is really connecting to the policy makers and the decision makers. I think there's a lot of expertise and smarts in this room, and we all care about prevention, and that's why we're here. Um, but as far, and that's not to say that policy makers and decision makers don't, but their level of expertise isn't at our level. So it's about connecting with them and thinking about how do they help us move the needle in this space and what's important to them to get them to, to come around to that. And, there, and there's some low-hanging fruit there, I believe. I mean, in Pennsylvania, we knew that we were spending uh, $2 billion a year on the state correction system. So go to your deep end systems that, that have huge line items in the state budget and then say, well, can we just chip away at, a little bit at this? We asked for 1% of the corrections budget in Pennsylvania to be shifted towards effective, proven effective, tested effective prevention strategies. So 1% of a $2 billion budget. That wasn't a heavy lift, right? I mean, that seems like a pittance to ask. But effective prevention is really cost effective. You can do a lot with 1% of a $2 billion corrections budget. Yes. And I think that's what, and let anybody have a last comment on that? Susan, Amanda. I think what's critical here and what everyone in this room represents is the ability to do advocacy. Uh, and I think uh, both uh, Brian and Jessica are talking about that. It's not just talking to your you know, local, state, and federal representatives, but it's talking to each other. I hope that Colorado will build in a, uh, other conferences like this where communities get to come and talk to each other. Uh, as well, because I think there's strength in numbers. I think uh, the experience in, in Pennsylvania of building communities that care over two decades uh, survived the DNR. Uh, uh, <coughs> Dave and Rico, no, <laughs> Democrat and Republican governorships, and you know went through those different because there were community where it was community voice. So I think that you all really have uh, advocacy uh, and as a result funding in your, uh, in your uh, grasp, if you will, uh, and these community-based efforts can, I know there's a new governor uh, uh, will be in next year, right? Is it, next year is the mm -hmm. race? I think that we should be influencing the candidates for that office uh, over the next year to talk about what are you doing about prevention? and give them some good ideas. Thank you. Um, do we, it's time to break. Um, I know uh, we probably, if you'd like to talk to any of the presenters or myself or any of the people from this morning, you can meet us at while we're eating and uh, I will not stand in your way. <laughs>